Welcome everyone. This is our fifth planned postdoc seminar series, and I am Sunil Kenchanmane Raju, a postdoc at Michigan State University, working on comparative epigenomics. Uh, planned postdocs as an organization has started this uh, postdoc seminar series to give opportunity for uh, postdocs who have recent preprints or a recently published paper to present their work uh, to the peers. Uh, and this is our fifth uh, seminar series. And today we have uh, two fabulous speakers, Jitesh Vijayan and Pan Liao, uh, um, who will be speaking on their current research, current research work. So let me first introduce our first speaker. So the seminar will be recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel. Um, each speaker will speak for 20 minutes, and then uh, there will be uh, seven to 10 minutes time for Q&A. And then after the seminar is over, we'll have a 30 minutes chat with the speaker session where there will be informal chat with the speakers. So our first speaker today is Dr. Jitesh Rujayan, who is a postdoctoral fellow in the Rebecca Rostam lab in University of Nebraska, Lincoln. Jitesh is from Coimbatore, a city in South Indian state of Tamil Nadu. He received his undergraduate degree uh, from Anna University, Chennai, and joined Dr. Wayne Rakoff's lab in the School of Biological Sciences, University of Nebraska-Lincoln in 2013. Jitesh worked on a variety of intra and intercellular signaling systems in microalgae during his graduate research, and his dissertation is on the role of TOR and ROS signaling under macronutrient limitation in microalgae, in microalgae chlorella serotoniana. At present, he's a postdoctoral fellow with Rebecca Roston in Department of Biochemistry at University of Nebraska. Along with a diverse group of researchers, Roston Lab is studying the effect of archaeal antioxidants on growth and biomass yield of plants. Jitesh is interested in algal growth, stress response, signaling systems, and systems biology. Recently, algae-based carbon dioxide sequestering has captured his interest and is envisioning a career as a faculty in India with a focus on algal growth, physiology, and synthetic biology. With that, I'll let you take over, Jitesh. Thank you, Sunil. Um, Sunil has been my friend for about eight years, and he still can't pronounce my organism's name <laughs> well. Um, thanks, thanks to the Plant Postdoc Association and uh, Alison, Arif, and Sunil, and others for giving me this opportunity uh, to, to talk about my work. Um, uh, as, as, uh, as the title of the talk goes, it is ROS again. So it's going to revolve around ROS. I'm going to tell a story linking ROS and membrane remodeling in this microalgae in a nutrient limitation condition. Uh, so that's my uh, Twitter ID. Uh, you're welcome to follow me. Um, so uh, as Sunil said, uh, I did my PhD with Dr. Wayne Reichhoff, and the work that I'm going to present today is uh, from my PhD work. So uh, here is the bioarchive uh, preprint, um, and uh, um, uh, and uh, you're welcome to read the paper um, um, at leisure uh, at your convenience. So let me begin by thanking the people, those who have stood by me through the process of getting this story into a decent shape. Uh, of course, my PhD advisor, Dr. Wayne Rykoff, and the Rykoff lab members, uh, and my committee members, uh, uh, including Rebecca Rastin, uh, who's linked to a whole bunch of people in this audience. Uh, and she's also my current uh, postdoc advisor uh, and uh, plant postdoc for hosting me and, and, um, and NASA for the funding. So let me give you the context of the story. Where does it begin and why? Why are we studying this? Um, so we all would have seen this or similar chart in the past decade or so showing uh, the, uh, the increase in carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. Um, so this is a trend that is, um, um, there's no question or doubt over there that this trend exists. Another trend that you have to consider is that uh, the population uh, uh, growth that has happened thanks to uh, health developments and the agricultural developments across the globe. Um, um, that has led to a projection of nine plus billion people by 2050. 
added to the fact is that the population that is growing is predominantly in the less developed nations or the developing nations, which means that the carbon footprint of those people is lower today when compared to the developed nations. When they eventually develop their per capita uh, uh, carbon consumption or the carbon footprint is going to go higher, which is actually a dreadful uh, nightmare situation because uh, um, because the, C, uh, the CO2 level in the atmosphere is going to probably go up in an exponential fashion. Now, the predominant source for this is actually uh, the crude oil, burning of crude oil and the dependence of crude oil. Um, now, keep in mind that in thankfully for the past 20-ish years, we have had uh, 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 the, the, the overtake from uh, renewable uh, energy resources like say wind, solar, geothermal uh, and so on and so forth. But the caveat with all of these ones that I mentioned, they help us weed off our dependence from, uh, from crude oil, but they don't actually suck up carbon dioxide from atmosphere. For that, you actually do need biofuels, a uh, variety of different sources access for biofuels. This audience probably doesn't need to be enlightened about that. One specific uh, uh, niche uh, for, bi uh, for biofuels is algal biofuels with a variety of advantage that it grows fast, it, uh, it can thrive in uh, many, many different harsh conditions, may that be the Arctic cold or, uh, or uh, Negev deserts, uh, 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 scorching conditions. Um, it, it doesn't have to compete with uh, agricultural land, a whole bunch of these advantages exist. Um, but then there is also, of course, there's caveats that uh, we still don't have this in the commercial uh, uh, angle yet because it has not reached the commercial end because uh, we don't still have a strain that uh, really grows well and accumulates oil uh, uh, and, uh, and it's not still comp competitive with crude oil. But keep in mind, all of this, there is one underpinning uh, reality that we still don't understand everything about algal biofuels or why algae accumulate oil, how we can manipulate and so on and so forth. So the, 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 the pretext of my work is to understand as much as possi uh, possible uh, of how and why algae accumulate oil, uh, and then, then we can go on to exploit it. So there are a couple of uh, protagonists or key players in the story, including me. The other one is Chlorella sorkiniana, the organism with which I work. It's an industrial microalgae. It has a fairly well annotated genome. Uh, it belongs to Troboxophaceae, which is a sister clade to Volvocaceae, in which the famous Chlamydomonas spots. Um, so uh, this was chosen uh, by the Nebraska Consortium for Algal Biology and Biotechnology, uh, under which our lab was in which our lab was a member. Uh, the other uh, key players in the story that you should know before we go in is triacylglycerol and uh, monogalactosyl diacylglycerol. Now, uh, these are glycerol lipids. That is, there is a glycerol backbone to which acyl chain or fatty acids, which I will interchangeably use, are attached. If three acyl chains or fatty acids are attached to the glycerol backbone, that becomes oil or triacylglycerol. But if you replace this SN3 position, pardon me, SN1 position with uh, any one of these moieties, they become uh, membrane lipids. So for instance, if you replace it with phosphocholine, it becomes phosphatidylcholine, phosphatidylethanolamine, glycerol, um, so on and so forth. Now, uh, based on the, uh, the moiety attached over here, they can either form a membrane lipid or uh, they can form a storage lipid like triacylglycerol. So uh, the, the third protagonist in the story is monogalactosyl, Diacyl glycerol, monogalactosyl, one glycerol molecule attached to the SN, uh, SN1 position. Now, uh, the, the beauty with this uh, lipid, it is an uh, archaeal, pardon me, it is a prokaryotic origin and it is present only, well, so far, uh, it's only known to be present in the plastids, chloroplast in this case. So it is a good marker for the membrane uh, composition of the chloroplast. Now let's go into the story um, of oil accumulation. Uh, so um, many different microalgae accumulate oil, uh, sort of chlorella sorokiniana, under stress conditions. Uh, the stress that is the best studied and, and probably one of the best for inducing oil accumulation is nitrogen starvation condition. Uh, what I'm showing over here is that under nitrogen replete condition, you 
hardly see any lipid droplets. Uh, but then under nitrogen starvation condition, you see these nice lipid um, droplets or oil bodies that's visible as Nile red fluorescence because Nile red is a dye that binds only to neutral lipids. Now, this is what we want. Actually, we want the cells to accumulate oil, but the caveat is that the cells obviously don't grow when compared to the control condition. Um, this is a nitrogen replete, this is nitrogen deplete. Now, added to this is another phenomenon uh, that the cells undergo chlorosis or, uh, well, not exactly complete chlorosis, but a degreening process. Anybody who has worked with nitrogen starvation in plants has a nitrogen or ion starvation in plants has observed this phenomenon of um, uh, they becoming lighter in green as opposed to thick grass green, right? So uh, the, the mechanism behind this is also, uh, thankfully, is also known. Um, uh, under nitrogen replete condition, you have these nice, dense thylakoid membranes in the cell, um, along with the pyranoid bodies, beautiful donut shaped pyranoid bodies. But what ends up happening is that if you put the cells under nitrogen starvation condition, the, uh, the thylakoid membranes are basically gone. And instead, what you have is uh, oil droplets. So thylakoid membranes are replaced by oil droplets. Um, so this happens, uh, so this is at the cellular level. What happens at the molecular level is that MGDG, the lipid that I was talking about, uh, is basically degraded under nitrogen starvation condition. Now, this might be a good time for me to explain how this experiment works, because this is a cornerstone of all the following experiments that I have done. So the way that this experiment is done is I grow the cells in the presence of C14 acetate. The C14 acetate gets incorporated into fatty acids, and those fatty acids are then incorporated into a variety of lipids uh, as, as shown over here. If you put them under nitrogen replete conditions, there is not a, a lot of difference in the, uh, in the composition of, uh, of these different lipids. But on the other hand, if you put them under nitrogen deplete condition or limitation condition, what you see is that uh, fatty acids from these different uh, lipids, um, uh, PCPE, MGDG, uh, uh, the fatty acid is stripped from that and then put into tag. So, which is clearly visible over here. Uh, and then as, as quantified over here, this is the control condition, nitrogen deplete condition. Um, but then under nitrogen deplete condition, you see that MGDG, uh, the preformed MGDG is basically stripped off, which then means that MGDG degradation is an essential component for the degreening or is an important component for degreening and oil accumulation. Now, we wanted to study this further on. Uh, and so as, uh, as is the new trend or, uh, well, has been a trend for a while, we did an RNA-seq analysis um, um, at, an, uh, at an earlier time point, nine hours and then 24 hours. We made a bunch of observations for the lack of time. I'm going to specifically focus on one. So one of the interesting things that came out of this transcriptome study uh, was that superoxide dismutase genes uh, were significantly downregulated. Now, superoxide dismutase genes are, as the name suggests, dismutating superoxide, uh, which is a reactive oxygen species. Uh, their levels actually go down, and so is the case of catalase. Uh, all these are enzymes that are involved in scavenging reactive oxygen species. Uh, so this uh, led me to the rabbit hole, and then I, I wanted to ask what happens to the other antioxidants in the, in the uh, other antioxidant systems in the cell. Um, one of them is ascorbic acid, uh, ascorbate, which is uh, uh, which is a key uh, antioxidant or a reductant in the uh, in the in the chloroplast. Many other compartments, chloroplast specifically. What we see is that uh, the genes that are involved in the synthesis of the, uh, of this antioxidant are significantly downregulated. Now, the other uh, key player is glutathione. Um, uh, so what happens in, in the case of glutathione is that the, that the expression of glutathione peroxidase, which are enzymes that use glutathione to scavenge uh, hydrogen peroxide, are downregulated. All of this put together uh, forms a, a picture that maybe reactive oxygen species accumulation is happening. We wanted to ask the question. Uh, we measured the, uh, the level of reactive oxygen species under nitrogen starvation condition using uh, um, a DCFDA, which is a cell permeable dye. And, and as, as over here, you see a drastic increase in the reactive oxygen species levels. So, uh, so, we, uh, so I, uh, I'm showing over here that it is a concerted effort that the reactive oxygen species accumulation happens. 
So um, really quickly, there are different kinds of reactive oxygen species. There is singlet oxygen, there is superoxide, there is hydrogen peroxide, hydroxyl radicals. Uh, now, these are not the only reactive species. There is reactive nitrogen species, polar metal class. Um, so uh, each one of these species is actually taken care in a different mechanism in, in the cell. Um, um, it, it could be um, carotenoids, tocopherols, uh, superoxide dismutase, catalase, ascorbate peroxidases. In each one of these species in both mammalian and plant lineage elicits a different kind of transcriptional response that's already known, uh, which is quite, quite an interesting um, uh, landscape over there. So now the question, uh, uh, so uh, apart from the reactive oxygen species itself, we see that many of the redoxin proteins like ferredoxin, uh, peroxyredoxins are also downregulated. Some are downregulated, some are upregulated. Why, why does this fit into, uh, into our story is because ferredoxin almost acts as a capacitor. It, it acts as a reservoir for redox potential. Uh, any change in the, in the expression levels of this means that there is redox change also happening. More so importantly, the fact that we see a change in pyridoxin and glutaridoxin is important because these are known to be uh, um, known to activate or deactivate proteins by thiol modifications, which means that not just uh, ROS signaling, there is redox signaling also happening in the system. So now I have mentioned that there is ROS uh, accumulation happening, and I've also mentioned that there is uh, membrane remodeling happening. The next obvious question is, does ROS signaling at all affect the membrane remodeling process under nitrogen starvation condition? To answer that question, uh, I took two-pronged approach. One, if I ectopically make the cells accumulate ROS, does that lead to uh, membrane remodeling or NGDG degradation? For that, what I did is I used superoxide dismutase inhibitor uh, and then what we saw is that, yes, indeed, if you treat the cells with superoxide dismutase inhibitor under nitrogen replete condition, as mentioned, as shown over here, which is TAP, um, you see that MGDG degradation is kick-started, it begins. The converse experiment, or the most important and interesting experiment, is that what happens under nitrogen starvation if you exogenously provide a reductant to quench the reactive oxygen species? For a variety of reasons, I chose ascorbate as the uh, reductant molecule or the antioxidant molecule. Under nitrogen starvation condition, if you provide the cells with ascorbate, yes, of course, uh, the, the level of the active oxygen species goes back significantly, reduced significantly. Now, what happens to MGDG and the oil accumulation, right? That's the important question. Uh, what we see is that this is uh, the control, which is nitrogen starved cells the level of MGDG drops uh, drastically really quickly. But then if the cells under nitrogen starvation are fed with ascorbate, what you see is that the, the degradation does happen, but the process is much slower. Now, uh, as I've shown you earlier, MGDG uh, degradation is correlated with tag accumulation. So if we see a change in tag accumulation, that, is, that fits really well into the equation. So thankfully, we, see, we do see that there is significant reduction uh, of tag accumulation in these cells if they are fed with ascorbate. That, that nicely ties the story together that there is a link between ROS and chloroplast membrane remodeling, and for that matter, uh, other membrane remodeling as well. And that goes back to the title of my talk, ROS is not just a um, spectator, it's not just bystander, it actually has a significant role in membrane remodeling itself. Now, where does this reactive oxygen species come? Anybody who studies photosynthesis can immediately say, hey, yeah, that's PS2 system, the biggest contributor of ROS in, in, a, uh, in, in, in the plant lineage. So that was my hypothesis. I still wanted to cross-check that. Uh, so to do that, what we did is that we took the cells, uh, put them under nitrogen starvation condition and put them either under light, 24 hours light or complete dark um, condition. After 24 hours, what we saw is that there is no difference in ROS accumulation at all, which is kind of surprising, but we still went ahead and asked what happens to MGDG levels and uh, much to our uh, dismay, there is no change. Uh, in the uh, neither in ROS accumulation or membrane remodeling. That then triggers this idea that maybe photosynthesis is not the ROS source under nitrogen starvation condition. Go back to the transcriptome, comb through, and what we found is that a whole bunch of enzymes whose 
uh, uh, one of the byproduct is uh, either hydrogen peroxide or superoxide. These enzymes are transcriptionally upregulated. These uh, these are amine oxidases, and this one is an NADPH oxidase. This is xanthine oxidase. Now, if you uh, plug this back into the equation, it becomes clear that the ROS accumulation process is a two-pronged process. It's an active process with two prongs. One is downregulation of the quenching process and upregulation of the synthesis process. A very nice concerted process of uh, ROS accumulation. So we wanted to take this work one step forward and we asked what is the role of NADPH oxidase in this entire process. Uh, thankfully, NADPH oxidase is fairly studied and its relevance in ROS accumulation, ROS signaling is studied both in plants and in, uh, uh, and in the uh, mammalian system. In the mammalian system, it's, it's referred to as NOx. And in the plant system, we have a different name, uh, RBOH, uh, um, A through H uh, forms. So, um, so we wanted to study what is the role of this specific enzyme in ROS accumulation. So uh, to do that, unfortunately, we don't have a, trans, uh, tr a, a genetic transformation system for this organism. So I had to depend on chemical uh, genetics. So we used uh, um, this inhibitor ML171, which is a specific inhibitor for NADPH oxidase. Much to our uh, dismay, there was no change in the ROS levels. But what we see is that NGDG uh, uh, degradation is is significantly reduced, or in other in other words, under uh, under minus n condition, if you inhibit NADPH oxidase activity, a lot more of uh, MGDG is saved from degradation. As is the case with ascorbate, we also see that um, that tag accumulation is downregulated, which then adds again back to the equation that NADPH plays a role in ROS signaling and thereby to uh, MGDG degradation as well. Really quickly, one more step. Um, uh, the role of we wanted to see if there is an interaction between calcium signaling and ROS signaling. Uh, it is uh, uh, the, the 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 incentive for this or the trigger for this was the fact that uh, NADPH oxidase in chlorella sarcaniana has this EF HAN domain, and EF HAN domain is known to bind to calcium and activate the protein. And, and this system exists in mammalian systems and uh, uh, and uh, in in Arabidopsis. Uh, and in 2014, there was this paper that actually showed that if that there is a calcium burst influx that happens uh, under nitrogen stabilization condition in chlorella, if you block that, you block oil accumulation. So we wanted to make that connection. So to do that, what we did is that under nitrogen replete condition, we fed the cells with calcium ionophore and asked what happens to ROS. As expected, there is an increase in ROS when compared to the control condition. And we also see that MGDG degradation is kick-started. Um, this is under nitrogen replete condition. If there is a calcium ionophore, there is uh, MGDG degradation as well, which then plugs nicely that calcium signaling controlling ROS accumulation is conserved in different lineages from plants, algae to uh, mammalian systems. So, so far I've, uh, I've shown that nitrogen starvation triggers oil accumulation, uh, it also triggers ROS accumulation, and that ROS accumulation is two-pronged, one by downregulation of ROS scavenging enzymes and by upregulation of ROS producing enzymes. This ROS is an essential element for uh, chloroplast membrane remodeling and tag accumulation. That brings to this one, this model, uh, this nice dense thylakoids uh, and green culture under nitrogen starvation ends up becoming pale green, and, uh, and you get uh, instead of thylakoids, you end up getting a lot of uh, lot of uh, oil droplets and cal uh, and ROS that's accumulated by a, by a variety of mechanisms just play a role in that. So um, with that, uh, I would be happy to take any questions. I have a question. You know me thinking about lipids here. So. Is it known which enzymes are converting MGDG into TAG? Yeah, um, so in, uh, um, um, in, in clammy, there is this enzyme called the PGD1, um, which was isolated in, in Christoph Benning's lab, our academic grandfather's lab, um, where that enzyme actually takes uh, MGDG and, and the strips of the uh, galactosyl group and makes the DAG. That DAG goes to um, um, the, goes to a TAG accumulation. That it's already known that enzyme. Okay, 
And then, sorry, do they know if it's like through the DGAT or the PDAT pathway or does, I guess I'm not, I'm not as familiar with algae. So I wasn't sure if they have both of the, all of the like canonical Kennedy cycle. Uh, yes, it does have all of the can uh, canonical pathway, but I don't think uh, so far anybody knows if it is PDAT or DGAT. Um, also, both are both the enzymes are upregulated under nitrogen starvation. Okay, yeah, that's both what the DGAT and the PDAT systems. So kind of figured good. that to make that much, you're gonna have to be doing like multiple yeah. routes yeah. to get tag. Yeah in under those conditions. Yeah, and it's also known that the PDAT pathway, um, is, there's a PDAT mutant as well, uh, which again has significant drop in um, um, you know, tag accumulation, but still it does have tag accumulation, which, which again goes back to the idea that maybe there is still DGET. Um, okay, yeah, so similar to like what you would see in like seeds where when yeah. you knock out one, yeah. you still are getting some accumulation. It's some balance between the two. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's correct, yeah. Okay, cool, thank you. Yeah. If anyone else has a question, feel free to unmute yourself and you can ask question. Okay, I have one question. As you can see, I'm not involved with this field, but I was just wondering how conserved is this phenomenon of oil accumulation under nitrogen limitation. Is it also conserved in plants? Uh, um, that's a good question. I don't know how much, uh, um, how much oil accumulation is conserved, but I do know that uh, nitrogen starvation triggers membrane remodeling in, uh, in uh, land plants. Uh, so it's possible that uh, they will also uh, have some amount of oil accumulation. But that said, I would not say that uh, the oil accumulation will be this pronounced uh, with, the, with, with, the, uh, with the case of algae. Yeah, I mean, that would be a good engineering thing, right? If you can limit nitrogen and get more oil accumulation in crops like soybean or even camelina, so yeah. maybe that could be a good thing. But I don't know the the composition of the oil and those things might be a factor also. Yes, you're perfectly right about that. But the caveat is that uh, nitrogen is the second most necessary nutrient in the cell right after carbon. If you starve for nitrogen, um, your growth is penalized significantly. Uh, and for plants, if you want to grow them in a, uh, how would you impose nitrogen starvation, right? Um, um, for algae, it's fine. Like you know, you can spin it out and then put it into a media that uh, that lacks nitrogen or something like that. But for plants, um, um, making them exposed to a nitrogen starvation and having any decent amount of biomass yield is going to be a very big um, trouble. Yeah, I mean, I can see how that can be done using uh, genetic engineering, right? You can yes. do it just in the stages of oil accumulation. Uh, yeah. Anyways, I mean, that's a discussion for later, but I was also wondering then, what are the other phenotypic effects of nitrogen limitation in chlorella? So, um, so for, uh, there are many, many different ones. Say for instance, uh, oh, you mean phenotypic. Um, mm -hmm. they, they reduce the fatty acid synthesis. They reduce uh, um, 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 many amino acid synthesis, of course, because you, know, you don't have nitrogen. You don't want to make all of these nutrients. Um, uh, and uh, uh, when it comes to the growth aspect itself, um, the, the predominant one is that the cell size becomes slightly bigger, possibly to accommodate the uh, starch and oil granules. Um, and, and with Chlamydomonas, Chlamy is a motile organism, right? With Chlamy, um, the, the flagella is dropped and it will form uh, spores-like uh, situation if the opposite get, um, mating type is available. Um, but um, chlorella doesn't have mating type, so it just forms this big blob and stays there. Okay, thanks. Uh, are there any other questions for Jitesh? I have one more, sorry. Sure, yeah, go ahead. So when they're like, when you're thinking about doing like algal biofuels, Right, and there's this idea of that like we can grow them in non-arable land in the desert and that sort of thing. 
are they imposing these nitrogen or other stresses to induce more tag accumulation than in those scenarios? Or are they just like genetically manipulating them to create more tag? Neither, unfortunately, um, because um, uh, so in, in an industrial scale, right? So for us, it's fine. You just spin the cells and then put them into the um, nutrient deplete, deplete media. Uh, but uh, in, in an industrial setting, that process may be difficult. So what they generally do, to the best of my knowledge, is um, let the culture grow. When towards the end, of course, they are going to start getting, uh, you know, start for nutrients and one of them will be nitrogen. Um, uh, this thing. And, the, and as far as the genetic uh, uh, system goes, uh, uh, well, from about for the past decade, there has been this idea to find a trigger, a transcription factor or something like that, where you can induce it and then that, uh, uh, you know, causes this wonderful uh, oil accumulation. Um, but there is no, so far, there has not been a universal transcription factor that will, that, that you can use in all different organisms. In climate, there is one, but again, it's not conserved in many other organisms. Uh, and the, uh, the other caveat with genetic transformation is, uh, like, you know, it, I, to the best of my knowledge, there are no uh, genetically transformed algae that's there out in the field, in you know, in tanks inside the settings, which is like you know, it's all it, it can be done because you know you can control the leakage of spillage of uh, cells outside. Um, um, but yeah, in the in the open settings, not to the best of my knowledge. Okay. Uh, and again, when you're going to the biofuels, you cannot do um, you know in the lab, right? It has to be in the field. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, Jitesh. Uh, thank you, thanks for the questions. Um, yeah, so uh, in the next session, we can also have some informal chat about your work. Now we'll be moving on to our second speaker. Um, uh, Pan Liao is a postdoc in Purdue University. He works in the lab of Professor Natalia Dudareva. He obtained his PhD degree in molecular biology in 2015 at the University of Hong Kong. During his PhD, he investigated the function of hydroxymethylglutaryl-CoA synthase in the mavalonate pathway. He found that the overexpression of HMGS resulted in enhanced plant growth and seed yield in tobacco, and manipulation of this in tomato also increased the production of vitamin E, carotene, and lycopene besides steroids. Uh, this this work demonstrated the crosstalk between the cytosolic MVA pathway and the plastidic NEP pathway. His follow-up studies are revealing some novel connections between the MVA pathway and the glucosinolate biosynthesis in Arabidopsis, or potential crosstalk between the MVA pathway and central metabolic pathways in tobacco. Uh, Pan is interested in, look, in looking for a job in academia. And with that, I will let Pan take over. Yeah, thank you very much, Sonia. Thank you very much for your uh, comprehensive introduction. Yeah, I also want to thank Edison for a lot of curious uh, helping for organizing the whole activity. Yeah, I will share my screen. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, yeah, so the title of the presentation is the release of volatiles from peculiar flowers uh, is in fact in influenced by cuticle thickness. This is some work uh, we've done like uh, in Purdue in the past several years. Um, so first let's have a look at the volatiles. So in fact, the volatile organic compounds, there are many kinds of, from different kinds of flowers, plants, okay, also fruits, and then they, uh, also have uh, multiple functions. For example, they play, play significant role in reproduction, defense, uh, stress, uh, pest, pest management, and also they contribute to the uh, atmospheric chem uh, chemistry, and then they, they involve in uh, plant uh, communications, and also they contribute to the different flavors of uh, for the different fruits. Um, so once they uh, synthesize in a uh, cytosol or plastic, they, they will need to transfer to, uh, to the plasma membrane, okay, with the help of vesicles or with the help of lipid transfer proteins. 
Yeah, once they arrive the part membrane, they will need to go to the cell wall, okay, by uh, apoptosis, uh, excitosis, and also always the help of EBC transporters. Yeah, so Natalia lab previous uh, identified an ABC transporter, which is a, a volatile transporter that can uh, make the help the, tra uh, help the uh, transporting of volatiles through the plasma membrane. Yeah, after they um, go through the plasma membrane, they need to go through the cell wall. Yeah, so with the help of LTP, like lipid transfer proteins, yeah, they will go to the cuticle. Yeah, so pure uh, assumption is that uh, once the volatiles are in cuticle, they will just uh, passively diffuse uh, and then emit into the atmosphere. Yeah. Um, however, the purest uh, mathematics from the derived lab, um, the modeling like uh, predict, predicted that out of all these barriers, the cuticle provides the highest resistance to VOC efflux. Uh, so now the first question we want to ask is that like uh, how much of the volatiles are in the cuticle part? Yeah, so to answer that question, we do developed a method, yeah, we want to check the VOC distribution in cuticle, yeah, so the basic uh, brief uh, protocol is that uh, we, we can get the total internal volatile pools, yeah, we dissolve them in uh, equilibromethanol, uh, just an organic solvent, and then we, we will dip the three flowers, for example, in a shorter time, for five to uh, two to five seconds in her thing. And then from this uh, solution, we will like uh, analyze the uh, volatile in the same part. As, uh, at the same time, we will analyze the uh, wax in the Hessian part. Yeah. Uh, finally, we will also get in the total wax in the Hessian. So uh, for this, with uh, here we to get the total wax in the Hessian, uh, we will dip it uh, longer, deeper the flowers for thirty seconds. Yeah, to get all the. Uh, uh, wax from the cuticle part. Yeah, so finally we will calculate, for example, the VOC distribution in cuticle, which will be equal to the VOC in Hessian uh, over the VOC, uh, total VOC, okay? And then the value will rate, because here, for example, we may taking 70% uh, of the cuticle, of the wax out of the cuticle. Yeah, so we need a recovery rate, yeah. Uh, so uh, indeed, so, our results show that uh, actually the VOC um, needs about 50% of the VOC uh, holding in a, a cuticle. Um, so let's also have some background about the plant cuticle and its function. So plant cuticle um, is a manicular transporter barrier uh, which can protect uh, plants from drought, stress, and the passenger infection, and also pre uh, protect the plants uh, 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 from organ uh, organ fusion during development, yeah. So or, although previously there are a lot of studies reporting the interaction of the atmospheric VOCs with the cuticle, uh, yeah. However, how the cuticle is involved in the release of volatiles in flowers, like uh, into the uh, atmosphere, remains unknown. So we want to test, like uh, we want to answer this question, yeah. So the next question is like, how can we like uh, change the cuticle properties in flowers? Yeah, so we have searched some uh, literature and then our potential strategy is that maybe we can like download, uh, downregulate it of like regulating the ABC transporter, which is a wax transporter. Okay, you can, as you can see here, the uh, published papers reporting that the ABC 11, 12, and 13, they are like wax transporters. Yeah, so our strategy is that we want to like regulate this. Yeah, so these are also some background information about the reported Abidopsis uh, uh, ABCG mutants. Okay, so for the ABCG mutant, uh, ABCG 12 mutants, as you can see here, they have some unusual linear inclusions and also some interactions in tracks of cytosol in vas uh, vacuoles. Um, also, when they analyze the total wax, they found that, in fact, the next mutant has uh, significantly reduced total wax. 
Yeah, there's another member like ABCD11 from apoptosis. So the mutation, like the, this mutation causes the reduced growth, as you can clearly see here, and also uh, organ fusion. So you can see from um, stem fusion, yeah, and leaf and leaf uh, fusion. Um, also, like uh, as, uh, when they do the SEM, they found that actually the epicutical uh, wax crystal density is much lower in the mutant than the wild type. Uh, also, the total wax was reduced in the mutant. Yeah, uh, furthermore, they found that actually like ABCD11 and ABCD12 can form a, a heterodimer, and also ABCD11 can form a homodimer. Yeah, but ABCD12 cannot form a homodimer. Uh, so we searched our ISIC data, yeah, and we found that there are two hands. One hand is the homolog of Abdopsis ABCD11, another uh, one another hands is in the homolog of ABCD12. Yeah, so what we have done, we 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 down we try to down regulate it uh, ABCD11 or 12, okay, in petunia flowers and then the driven of uh, petal specific MYB promoter. Um, yeah, we also uh, checked in the expression of ABCD11 and the trial uh, during a uh, different stage of the flower development. Development uh, actually both of them are showing uh, higher expression during the early uh, uh, stage, which is inconsistent with the uh, timing of cuticle formation. So this somehow indicating that uh, it's it's correct. And they may be uh, correct uh, candidates. Yeah, of course we will have more evidence later. Yeah. Um, so we tried to uh, downregulate it like uh, like uh, uh, eleven. Uh, as well as twelve separately. Yeah, but we we were not able to. Uh, have any uh, transgenics from ABCD11 ionized, but we are able to get several from uh, ABCD12 ionized. As you can see here, the expression of ABCD12 are significantly lower. So we have selected this three nines, which showing the most uh, downregulated expression. Yeah, so. We are selecting this for the three lines for follow-up studies. So first we checked in the total wax amount, as you can see here, the total wax amount was significantly reduced. However, the relative composition, okay, basically didn't change uh, yeah, from each class. Uh, we also um, like analyzed that whether there is any phenotypic change for the transgenics. So as you can see clearly here, actually the only ionized, the size are much bigger, okay, than the controls. Yeah, in fact, the, 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 the surface is less smooth than the wire type. Uh, also, they are more transduent, okay. Uh, so we want to, to test it, like whether there's any defects in a cuticle. Yeah, so when we search paper, we found a paper which has been published uh, like a they use a, a dye, like a tutelin blue, that can stain the abdosis leaf or stem. Uh, if there is a defect of the uh, cuticle, then you can see the dye will be more easily to go inside. So the, the, there will be some, with some of the purple color or blue color coming out. So we also test this in our flowers. So as you can clearly see that after um, tutelin blue like stain for four hours, the the mutants, all the mutants can like uh, have some blue uh, staining. While there's no, basically no color for the wild type and the vector control, which indicating that, uh, oh, indeed, these transgenics uh, uh, have some defect in cuticle uh, property. Yeah, we have did some more experiments to support this. So for example, we uh, also checked in the cuticle signals. Yeah, as you can see here, actually the cuticle thickness was reduced about 22%. Yeah, so we, we are selecting this line, which is showing the most downregulated line for the follow-up experiments. For example, this is line uh, nine. Um, so we also did some like uh, SEM uh, pictures to to look about in the. Uh, phenotypes. So these two pictures are from Y type using the uh, epidermal cells. Okay, but from the uh, uh, mutants, we can also see some uh, uh, 
uh, cells has lost the, the uh, conical conical shape. Okay, and then they can be, become flattened. Yeah, and then we also ca calculate like how much of the cells become like this. So it's about twenty two percent. Okay, yeah. That they're showing uh, showing this kind of cells, but others are still normal. Yeah. Um, so we are consistent with the defects of the like the, with the reduced the sig uh, critical signals. Actually, the ionize also uh, lose water faster than controls. Yeah. Um, but uh, here, so we are not sure whether like the change of the uh, notable trends of the flowers could be uh, because of this water loss. So we also checked that like we put in the plants in a, in a high humidity condition yeah, and then see whether the flower phenotypic change can be recovered to the wild type size uh, phenotype. So uh, as you can see here, yeah, even when we put them in a high humidity uh, condition, the phenotypic changes are still there. They are not recovered, okay? And also the re uh, relatively fresh weight are still lower. Actually, we also checked that the total emission and the total internal pool, they are still uh, uh, reduced. Yeah, so we will, we will uh, talk more of the emission and the volatiles later, or the emission and the internal pools later. Yeah, so these results indicating that the phenotypic changes were not due to the uh, enhanced water loss. Uh, yeah, so here, um, because like if we uh, like uh, have some like defects in the cuticle, like previous studies indicating that there may be some uh, pleiotropic effect happened, uh, a lot of cellu cellular uh, functions. Yeah, actually this is a, a comment from a reviewer. Okay, yeah, so we, we checked uh, the total protein levels, sugar levels, starch levels, uh, chlorophyll levels, uh, carbon dioxide efflux, uh, and also the seed production, uh, also seed germination. So all these results indicating that uh, basically uh, there's not much difference uh, uh, in the transgenics. Okay. Yeah, so all the these results uh, indicating that actually like we have a good model like which has uh, uh, reduced the critical signals uh, so that we can use this as a model to test the effect of cuticle on the release of uh, volatiles. Yeah. So our previous hypothesis is that a thinner cuticle would permit increased volatile emission. Uh, however, um, in, con in, contrast, in contrast to our hypothesis, the total emission was reduced. Uh, also, the total internal pools was reduced, which indicated that maybe the biosynthetic uh, flux also reduced. So when we calculated it, indeed, may, uh, the biosynthetic flux also reduced. Uh, so, so we want to determine like uh, where in the sent biosynthetic networks inhibition take place. So either like the upstream of the volatile uh, uh, compound synthesis, like, which is the, for example, he, from here, phi biosynthesis pathway, or downstream of phi, like the VOC biosynthesis. Yeah, so we, we have phi the phenyl anony, okay, to our transgenics, and then we want to see whether, how, how about the results. So actually after feeding, the uh, biosynthesis was recovered, okay. Yeah, but then the emission is still lower. So this results indicating that the VOC biosynthetic uh, capacity was not affected in our RNI flowers. Yeah, when we check in the gene expression of the uh, genes in the phi biosynthesis, as well as the other one, which is a transcription factor, yeah. and also the ABCG1, which is a transporter, like a volatile transporter. Yeah. So we found that actually all these genes have been uh, downregulated. Yeah. So it indicating that the phi reduction in the uh, PPCT12 INS is transcriptionally uh, regulated. Yeah. So so here to further account for reduced VOC biosynthesis in comparatively uh, 
uh, analysis of wild type and transgenics, we define the VOC emission factor, which is equal to the v, uh, flux of uh, emission over the V flux of biosynthetics. So when the VF uh, is about one, it means that the VOC emission is mainly uh, controlled by biosynthesis. But uh, when the VF is smaller than one, it indicates the existence of mass transfer limitation. So I will introduce a little uh, more here. So if the VF is equal to one, it means that like uh, uh, no matter how much uh, the VOC uh, synthesized the inside, it will emit com completely, okay? Yeah. So when we check in the results, for example, like the transgenics here, uh, we found that the transgenics, in the VEF in the transgenics are lower. Okay, we also compare, try to compare the uh, each individual uh, volatile compounds. Okay, uh, this is something strange to us, like an interesting part we noticed. So for example, we, will, we only see the first four compounds are much lower in transgenics, but not for the uh, compounds with higher uh, volatility. Yeah, so these results indicating that uh, actually um, the cuticle sickness, like uh, uh, Seems affect affect in the volatiles with lower, relatively lower, but volatility compounds. But for the for the compounds with higher uh, volatilities, they don't affect much. Okay, so for example, like this is a benzo benzoate, benzo benzoate, uh, benzo aldehyde. So for these two comp, we will check the uh, emission and the biosynthetic flask. They are matching very well. Okay, so which means that they, uh, how, no matter how much they uh, synthesized, they just emit it. But for the BB, BB is like the first one, benzo, benzo it. Okay, which, uh, so there's some, uh, like uh, we don't see much overlapping here. There's some, uh, they are not, in, not mapping uh, like so, uh, so well with, uh, compared to these two compounds. Okay, which means that like, uh, Maybe, uh, if you like uh, what whatever you synthesize needs a delay for imaging. Okay, when we when we check the VOC distribution in these three transgenics, we found that okay, indeed. So in the transgenics, um, there is less uh, volatiles in the cuticle part. Okay, but which means that there are more inside. So to test, because we know that if, if there are more volatiles in, in, uh, inside the plasma membrane, it will cause toxicity to the membrane. So here we are trying, we are using a dye like a, called a protein iodide, okay? So if, if the membrane is intact, it will not, uh, the dye will not go inside to the nucleus. Okay, but then if there is a defect of the membrane, then the dye can easily go inside. So as you can see here, when we stain with wire type, they basically cannot go in uh, stain uh, nucleus, but uh, from the mutants, we can see that they, they are more easily to uh, go inside and stain a lot of nucleus. Yeah, which indicating that in, indeed the ABCD12 down regulation leads to the, um, the toxicity. Yeah, so uh, our uh, basic model is that in a wild type, when it's like about 50% of the cuticle here, uh, then there are also some, maybe some uh, remaining cuticles like uh, inside cell wall, plasma membrane, or cytosol, okay? But when the cuticle sickness is, uh, uh, is reduced, there will be less of the volatiles can be stay here, okay? So they have to go to the uh, plasma membrane. Yeah, but because there are too many of the volatiles in the plasma membrane, then they will feed back inhibition of the feed by synthesis here. Then like all the genes were, were downregulated, okay? And so that and less volatiles will be synthesized, yeah. So in summary, cuticle serves as a resistant barrier for VOC emission. And also it holds more than 50% of the internal VOCs that that's acting as a sink uh, storing VOCs to sustain efficient emission and uh, protect the cells from VOC uh, toxicity. Uh, and also it provides little resistance for compounds with relatively high volatility, but that's limit 
diffusion of VOCs with low volatility. Yeah. And then the inability of VOCs to build up in a thinner cuticle leads to the redistribution of internal volatile uh, pools and resulted in cellular damage. Cells sense uh, change in, in intracellular VOC distribution and the feedback inhibits VOC by synthesis at, at the transcriptional level. It looks like, for example, if they know that they need a toxicity for the membrane, they will tell inside, oh, don't, don't synthesize too much. Okay, we have enough, yeah, like this. Yeah, cuticle is more than a simple diffusion barrier, but a member of VOC biosynthetic network. Yeah, so finally, I want to uh, thank the funding from NSF and also thank my uh, supervisor, Natalia Dudareva, and all other uh, collaborators, John Morgan. Yeah, and uh, so Lynch now is an assistant professor at the West uh, Virginia University. So Rick, Rick is working now in a company now. Yes, called uh, helped us for the, the analysis of the uh, carbon dioxide efflux yeah, and around helped for some of the LCMS analysis. Yeah, so uh, Dr. Uh, Mao and Dr. Huang. Yeah, Dr. Mao and also like uh, left our lab recently. Yeah, is a PI in Israel now. Yeah, I also want to thank uh, Ben, who is a previous postdoc in our lab also. Like, uh, yeah, he helped for generating some of the transgenic plants. Yeah, so now he's in France. Yeah, back to, for several years. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. Thank you, really cool work. Ben. Uh, thank if you. If there are any questions, you can just uh, unmute yourself and ask questions to Pan. Pan, I have a question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, why do you think that you couldn't get a mutant for that ABCG11? Do you think that it's like that the mutation was lethal or was it just like a fluke thing at where you were only able to get the one? Yeah, it is possible that this that mutant, I mean, uh, is illegal. Yeah. Um, because even like in apodopsis, we can see see more severe, um, how to say, more severe uh, phenotype or, or severe uh, things from the, uh, from the abdosis buildings for 11, yeah, yeah. Because, and also you can see from the protein binding ex experiments, ABCG11 can, can bind itself and also can bind with other members like uh, ABCG12, yeah, but ABCG12 can, cannot form a homodimer, yeah. So I suppose maybe in the ABCG11 is more, it caused more uh, significant uh, uh, severe things, yeah, yeah. Yeah, originally we have several plants there, but uh, they, they, they didn't make up, yeah. It cannot recover, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Pan, I had a yeah. very general question. Mm -hmm. I was wondering when you, when with your mutants, when you have reduced cuticle thickness, does it also affect microbial infection? Um, in fact, this is very possible. Yeah, this is very possible because I think, uh, as, as, as I said in the uh, introduction, because the cuticle is also a, a barrier to protect the plants from stress. Yeah, so I think in the, it should be um, sensitive to microbials. Yeah, right? I was. I, yeah, I was also wondering. Off the mm -hmm. top of my head, I don't remember uh, any specific microbes attacking the flower tissues. It's usually mm -hmm. in the leaves, right? So I was wondering, maybe the flowers and the reproductive tissues are more tolerant to uh, microbial infection. I mean, of course, this is outside mm -hmm. the scope of. Talk, yeah, but I was yeah, just but, wondering, maybe that is also another thing that it doesn't affect so much because many microbes don't affect at the flowering stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is an interesting point. In fact, our previous, like Ben, like a previous um, uh, postdoc, um, he, he had tested this, not in the mutant plants. I mean, in his project, like the LTP on ionized, they tested the, like, uh, the microbiomes. Yeah, see how the microbiomes affect the no his transgenics. Yeah, and there are some differences. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, yeah. It it, it may also 
um, affect it. Yeah, and also it may relate it to jobs. You know, mm. yeah, yeah. So, so what we are thinking is that for future, we are also thinking like, uh, can we like uh, make thick cuticle, make a plant like flowers with thick cuticle, which, mm. which may pre protect the flowers better. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thanks. Uh, so, Pan, uh, yeah. my question is like, <clears throat> so in the, in your mute, the, your mutants, right? Uh, do they have any uh, defects that's not associated with uh, with the flowers, but more on the leaf or other tissues? Uh, does um, it have any effect there? Yeah. So, because first we because we are using a like the petal specific pr uh, promoter. Yeah, this is the reason. Yeah, we want to avoid any effects on those uh, leaves or stems. Yeah, yeah. So basically, we don't see much. Yeah, because sometimes if we're using a certified as promoter, sometimes it will also significantly affect the the growth of the plants. Yeah, we worry that we may don't have flowers. Yeah, with 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 that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so the so the next question is that then uh, have you so have you tried to actually knock down the synthesis genes in your uh, mutant backgrounds? Have you thought about that? Like, you know, what will happen if you knock out the synthesis genes? Do you think the the phenotype will come back to the wild type levels? Knock out. Oh, knock out. Sorry, then uh, if you can knock out the synthesis of these volatiles. In, yeah. your, uh, 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 in your transport of mutants. Yeah. And do you think but, that they will come back to wild type? Yeah, but, uh, but why, why you think uh, if we knock out it, I mean, if we knock out it, if, if this sent by, by synthesis gene is essential, it will also further reduce the by synthesis of volatiles, right? I mean, I mean what, we, what we have done before actually, because we noticed that like all the standard by synthesis genes like uh, reduce as well as the transcription effect the other one. Mm -hmm. uh, what we tried before is that we, we, we want to over express of the other one. Yeah. And then we want to see like whether over expression of the other one will recover the uh, the phenotypic change also like of all the reduced uh, standard emission, like whether the standard emission can come back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this, this is something we are doing, yeah. Uh, the, the last question. So what, what yeah. is the specific function of these volatiles? Is it just attraction of, uh, mm -hmm. of pollinators or do they have any other uh, yeah. specific function, Petunia? Yeah, they, they, they can, uh, uh, for example, attract the pollinators. Yeah, they, because, uh, because they will also affect the pollination, and then this process will also affect, for example, the seed yield, like the pod set. Yeah, mm -hmm. it may also affect the, the, the size of the pod. Yeah, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, yeah. if there are any other questions for Pan. Okay, if not, uh, let's congratulate both the speakers, Pan and Jitesh for the wonderful talk. Uh, I'll stop recording now and then we'll move on to the informal session. <laughs>